question is, have you ever been in the midst of something where you had to ask yourself, what was the point of all that? Now, I know Terry and Kristen can just ask, what was the point of all that? Um, Have you ever looked at something and said, that didn't make any sense at all, and it seemed pointless? Well, when I was getting ready to leave for boot camp, uh, when I was going into the Marine Corps, my older brother, who was a Marine before me, tried to prepare me for what was to come. He, again, he was already in the Marine Corps, so he'd already experienced everything that you could imagine that a person would go through in boot camp. So he told me that the drill instructors were going to be really hard on everybody regardless. Um, They were going to yell at everybody. They were going to scream at everybody. They were going to try to break you down physically and mentally and then try to build you back up as Marines. They were going to even break down, they were going to deprive you of even something as simple as your own dignity. Um, All I could say is that (laughs) that was an understatement. It was a little, my brother trying to prepare me for that was a little like trying to drop a ghost pepper into your salad and say you're just adding a little bit of heat. Um, He was not kidding. He could have walked me through the day-by-day agenda of everything that was going to take place in boot camp and it still would not have been enough. It still would not have prepared me for what I was going to experience. And during boot camp, a lot of the stuff that we went through didn't seem to make any sense. I mean, some of the stuff, okay, you understand that you know, you're gonna run three miles a day, four miles a day, five miles a day. You're gonna, you're gonna run and you're okay, well, that's to get us into shape. But there were a lot of things that they did to us in boot camp that while you were going through it, it just didn't seem to make any sense. Um, Yelling and sleep deprivation, that was because, the whole reason for that was because if you find yourself in the unfortunate circumstance of going into combat, sleep deprivation, loud noises, and, and all that, it's commonplace. When we graduated physically, we were in the best shape of our lives. However, there were still a couple of things that just never really sat right with me. You know, why did we have to go through that in boot camp? And there was one thing in particular that just didn't make any sense to me. It never made any sense. So when I graduated and I crossed the the graduation deck, I went over to my senior drill instructor and I asked him, you know, Staff Sergeant, what was the point of this? And what it was was that the whole of a day that we were going through all of our training and our drills and and everything, Marines weren't allowed to talk to one another. Now, we were given an hour of free time every night where we were allowed to read letters, write letters, shine our boots, clean our rifles, and that sort of thing. However, that was the only time period we were allowed to speak to one another. It was that one little one-hour time frame. But as soon as that one hour was up and the yelling started again, communication ceased. And it just, again, it didn't make sense to me. So what was his explanation for that? After most wars came to their conclusion, they found, um, from, now this is going all the way back to World War II, all the way up through Vietnam and now Afghanistan, Marine POWs were the ones that seemed to have the best survival and recovery rate. Um, so when, what, what was happening was when When they were POWs, when they were in captivity, they're not, they're being restricted from talking to one another because their captives or their captors felt that if you were talking to one another, you were trying to plan your escape. So when you're a POW, you're not allowed to speak. And people that weren't subjected to that sort of thing would struggle. And so Marines, hey, we were used to it. You know, we've already been through it. So um, they had the best survival and recovery rate. Now, at that point, it seemed to make sense. Okay, stuff started to fall into place. But what about today? What about us as Christians? Do we ever go through anything that just doesn't seem fair or just doesn't seem to make sense? Um, it leaves us asking questions. Is it okay to ask questions? Is it, is it considered sacrilegious to question God? Well, there's a couple of points I want to make this morning. The first one is simply this. It is okay to ask questions. 
not only is it okay to ask questions, but we are encouraged to do so. Let me say that again. It's okay to ask questions, and we're encouraged to do so. I'd like you to turn with me, if you would. Now, here's a, here's a book that, that you probably don't get to very often. But if you would, turn with me to Habakkuk, chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. If you're following along in your pew Bibles, that can be found on page 763. Again, this is Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Habakkuk 1, verses 1 through 4 reads, The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, Violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Now, Habakkuk asks questions. Habakkuk finds himself living during a time when justice and fairness just didn't seem to exist. As a matter of fact, he mentions the word violence in his cries, so we could assume that times were pretty bad. Sound a little like reading the news on the internet today? You know, stuff that's going on, people just breaking into stores, ransacking, taking whatever they want, you know, mugging, hurting, shootings. It's, it's violence. Now, we've heard several messages over the last year or so regarding the Psalms of Lament and the benefit of incorporating lament into our own lives. Isn't that what lament is? Is asking God why? Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18. Again, if you're following along in your pew Bibles, it can be found on page 553. I'm actually going to read it from the English Standard Version. Um, Again, this is Isaiah, chapter 1. Verse 18. Isaiah 118 reads, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. The word in the original Hebrew that we translate here as reason together, or as the NIA, NI, can't speak this morning, as the NIV translates, let us settle the matter, can also mean argue out together or be vindicated, to complain, to determine what is right. All of these definitions seem to indicate that the Lord wants to talk to us about it. One more time, turn with me, your fingers are going to get your exercises this morning. Turn with me to James chapter 1, verse 5. Again, in your pew Bibles, this is on page 977. James chapter 1, verse 5. People always say, but Dave, you're reading from the Old Testament. Ah, sneak a New Testament verse in there every now and then. James 1, verse 5 reads, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. The original language here for the word wisdom can also be translated as understanding, cleverness, skill, technical expertise. God wants us to understand. He wants us to come to him for understanding. And now you ask, Dave, there are some things in the world that happen that are just so horrific that there can't be any reason for it. There have been things that have happened in my own life where I call out to God for understanding and he doesn't seem to answer. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, I don't know if you remember, but a couple of messages ago that I preached, I preached a sermon on why bad things happen to good people. You guys remember that? Um, I believe my ultimate answer to that was, I have no idea. However, if you remember... In that message, I I mentioned understanding 
is not required when we suffer. Faith is, trust is, obedience is, but understanding is not. The second point that I want to make this morning is that we don't always need to understand or even have the answers. We need to trust and obey. Amen? Turn with me to Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Okay. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 read, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Also in Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, it reads, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. We aren't always going to understand what the Lord is doing, and what he is trying to accomplish in our lives, but we can trust him. In Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12, we read, You've searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Even David knew that the Lord hems him in behind and before. One of the definitions for the word to hem means to lay siege now, if you're a movie fan like I am and you watch some of these middle, middle, medieval kind of um, historical type movies, when they lay siege to a city, they surround the entire city. They, they, the entire army that's attacking just surrounds the city, doesn't allow anything in, doesn't allow anything out. That's what it means to lay siege. So if the Lord is hemming David in and if the Lord is hemming us in, in front of us and behind us. He is laying his angels around us. There's nothing that can get in or get out without his permission. If the Lord pays that kind of attention to us, if his thoughts for me started even before I started, shouldn't I be able to trust him? Well, that covers the trusting part, but what about the obeying part? Well, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 reads, But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. You know, we sing worship songs on Sunday mornings about our sacrifice of praise being lifted up as an offering to the Lord. There's even a worship song that says, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We sometimes raise our hands in worship, and that's all well and good, but the Lord says, rather than all that, he prefers our obedience. Oh, that we were sensitive enough to the leading of the Holy Spirit and strong enough to obey. So when we don't understand or even have the answers, we don't always need to. We need to trust and obey. So I get that, Dave. I try to trust and obey, but I'm still left with questions. Why? Why is it that believers suffer? What's the purpose of all this? 
Well, when we suffer, it's only natural to want to find a reason for it. Paul wrote a letter to the church at Corinth, calling them on the carpet for all of the sin that they allowed into their congregation. His second letter, though, takes kind of a softer tone. And that's because Paul was attempting to restore his now strained relationship with them. And he's using the second letter as a way of saying, you guys are doing much better, thank you. I, I, see, what you're, I see you, I see what you're doing, and I, I appreciate that. But if you would, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, in your pew Bibles, you can find this on page 935. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, we start, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. My third and final point this morning is simply this. We go through things so that we can comfort others going through what we went through with the comfort that we receive from God. This is the purpose behind the pain. This is the reason for the suffering. Have you ever been with a friend who was going through, say, the loss of a parent, and you've already lost one of your, or in, in my case, I've lost both my parents, and you could simply sit there and say, I know, I understand. There's comfort in that. Have you been with somebody who's struggling with a relative or a family member who is struggling with addiction, and you've been through it as well with a friend or a family member, and you could simply say, I know, I understand. This past Christmas, we held a, a wonderful blue Christmas service. Now, I know this sounds like a, an oxymoron um, to say that it was a blue Christmas service and also say it was wonderful, but it was. It was a time to remember and to celebrate the lives of those that we lost that might have been preventing us from experiencing the joy of the season. It was a time to come together and to comfort each other with the comfort that we've received. It was a time to say, I know, I understand. Now, I had never attended a blue, serv or blue Christmas service before, but I could tell you it won't be our last. And as I mentioned in that previous message before, I can't give you the why and why these things happen, but the point of my message this morning is that there can be purpose in the pain. That purpose is that we allow the Spirit of God to change us into His likeness, and then with that we can comfort others with the comfort that we receive from him. This could be something as simple as saying, yeah, my computer did the same thing. Let me show you how I got past it and what I did to fix it. Or it could be something as complicated as saying to someone you know, I remember what it was, lo what it was like when I lost my job. I'm here for you. If you need anything, let me know. But in the meantime, let's get your resume updated. Now, this usually takes the form of being empathetic to those who are suffering as you have. But we can also be empathetic to those whose circumstances are unique. While the specifics of their suffering may be unfamiliar, we all share one thing in common. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Again, in your pew Bibles, this could be found on page 983. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 10.
In 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 10, we read, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Now verse 7 tells us that we need to cast all our cares on him. When we are suffering, that is a great place to start. If we are with someone that's suffering, we can help them do that. Pray with them. Even if we haven't been through what they're going through, verse 9 encourages us that we should know that the family of believers throughout the world are undergoing the same thing. Now, in Peter's day, there were far far fewer believers then than there are now. But we all have a part that we can play. And the best part of the passage, though, is in verse 10. Peter goes on to state, The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. God himself will restore us and make us strong, firm, and steadfast. Wow. I think about how God restored Job after Job went through his suffering and I can't even imagine what it would look like. Now as I conclude this morning, I want to remind you that in and amongst the myriad of ministries that our church is involved in here, we are also referred to as a house of refuge church through an organization called lovelife.org. What that means is we provide support for those that have either chosen life for their unborn and may need some assistance through providing support to those who may have been through or or, or also providing support to those who may have been through an abortion themselves. With that, Love Life's statement for the House of Refuge is simply this. Faith Church is a house of refuge. This applies to everyone in this church or people you know that need a place of refuge. Here's what we believe. If you find yourself in an unplanned pregnancy, please know that being pregnant is not a sin, and the child that you carry is not a punishment. It is a blessing. God is knitting this child in your womb. You may have made a sinful decision that led to this pregnancy, or you may have even been sinned against. But we want you to know that you are loved. And we will do whatever it takes to help you carry and care for this precious child before and after birth. We can never support or encourage a woman to have an abortion because the child you carry is made in the image of God and is intrinsically valuable and loved by God. You need to know how we will respond. Now here's what we won't do. This church family will not gossip about you, shame you, or abandon you. This is a house of refuge, and we will not allow for the family of God to harm one another with words or actions contrary to the love of God as revealed in his word. What we will do, we will do everything in our power to remove whatever obstacles stand in the way of you having this child. There are people in this church ready to mentor you, throw you a baby shower and connect you with the resources inside and outside of our church. Like for instance, a local pregnancy care center. We will also hold men accountable for living out their calling to provide and protect women and children. And finally, if you've ever had an abortion in your past, we want you to know that abortion is not an unforgivable sin. Whoever confesses and forsakes their sin finds mercy. And if you have never gone through an abortion recovery Bible study, we would be happy to connect you to one so that you can walk into complete healing and freedom. 
Now, this organization that helps us provide in comfort to those making or have already made one of the most difficult decisions of their lives, they provide a very valuable and much needed service in our community. That said, the church as a whole needs to be a house of refuge regardless of the suffering. Now, their focus is on abortion and abortion recovery, but we can be a house of refuge regardless of what we are going through, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. If you don't feel equipped to help, that's okay. There are those of us that can. Please let us know if we can help and how we can help. If you're going through something right now, please don't assume that everybody knows what's going on. Most of us have no idea. However, do know that there are those of us that would be more than willing to pray with you. All you have to do is ask. And even if you don't want to go into the details, that's okay. Let us pray with you and for you. God knows what the circumstances are, even if we don't.